Chapter 11, The Touch of Superior Energy, from the first canto, 8th chapter, 28th text of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Tvam kalam ishanam Anadi nidanam vibum Samam charantam sarvatra Bhutanam yan mitaha kali Translation My Lord, I consider your Lordship to be eternal time, the supreme controller, without beginning and end, the all-pervasive one. In distributing your mercy, you are equal to everyone. The dissensions between living beings are due to social intercourse. Purport by Srila Prabhupada Kunti Devi knew that Krishna was neither her nephew nor an ordinary family member of her paternal house. She knew perfectly well that Krishna is the primeval Lord who lives in everyone's heart as the Supersoul, Paramatma. Another name of the Paramatma feature of the Lord is Kala or Eternal Time. Eternal time is the witness of all our actions, good and bad, and thus resultant reactions are destined by Him. It is no use saying that we do not know why we are suffering. We may forget the misdeed for which we may suffer at this present moment, but we must remember that Paramatma is our constant companion, and therefore He knows everything, past, present, and future. And because the Paramatma feature of Lord Krishna destines all actions and reactions, he is the supreme controller also. Without his sanction, not a blade of grass can move. The living beings are given as much freedom as they deserve, and misuse of that freedom is the cause of suffering. The devotees of the Lord do not misuse their freedom, and therefore they are the good sons of the Lord. Others who misuse freedom are put into miseries destined by the eternal Kala. The Kala offers the conditioned souls both happiness and miseries. It is all predestined by eternal time. As we have miseries uncalled for, so we may have happiness also without being asked, for they are all predestined by Kala. No one is therefore either an enemy or friend of the Lord. Everyone is suffering and enjoying the result of his own destiny. This destiny is made by the living beings in course of social intercourse. Everyone here wants to lord it over the material nature, and thus everyone creates his own destiny under the supervision of the Supreme Lord. He is all-pervading and therefore he can see everyone's activities. And because the Lord has no beginning or end, He is known also as the eternal time, Kala.
what is explained herein by the devoted Kunti is exactly confirmed by the Lord Himself in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 29. There the Lord says, Samoham sarva bhuteshu namedveshyo stina priya ye bhajanti tu mam bhaktya maite teshu chapyaham which means, quote, I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all. But one who renders service unto me in devotion is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. Unquote. God cannot be partial. Everyone is God's son, so how can God favor one son above another? That is not possible. But human beings discriminate. We write, in God we trust. But one who trusts in God must be equally kind and merciful toward all living entities. That is God consciousness. Krishna says, I have no enemies, nor have I friends. Namedvye shosti na priya. The word dveshya means enemy. We are envious of our enemies and friendly toward our friends. But because Krishna is absolute, even when he appears to be inimical towards some demon, he is actually a friend. When Krishna kills a demon, the demon's demoniac activities are killed, and he immediately becomes a saint and merges into the supreme impersonal effulgence, the Brahma Jyoti. The Brahma Jyoti is one of three features of the Absolute Truth. Vedanti tat tatva vidas, tatvam yajjnanam advayam, brahmeti paramatmeti, bhagavan iti shabdhyate. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Text 11. The Absolute Truth is one, but is perceived in three features, known as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. The original complete feature of the Absolute Truth is Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and His plenary representation is Paramatma, Kshirodakashai Vishnu, who is situated in everyone's heart. Ishvara Sarvabhutanam Riddeshe Rujana Tishtiti the third feature of the Absolute Truth is Brahman, the all-pervading impersonal effulgence of the Absolute. The Absolute Truth is equal to everyone, but one will realize the Absolute according to the way one approaches Him. Yeyata mam prabhadyante According to one's capacity for understanding, the Absolute Truth is revealed either as the impersonal Brahman, as the localized Paramatma, or ultimately as Bhagavan. To explain this by an example, we may sometimes see hills from our room, although we may not see them distinctly. In Los Angeles there are many hills, but when we see the hills from a distant place, they look like something cloudy. However, if we go further toward a hill, we shall find that there is something distinct, a hill. And if we go all the way to the hill itself, we shall find many people working there, many houses, streets, cars, and so many varied things. Similarly, when one wants to know the absolute truth by one's tiny brain and thinks, I shall conduct research to find the absolute truth, one will have a vague, impersonal idea. Then if one goes further and becomes a meditator, one will find that God is situated within one's heart. Dhyana vastita tadgatena manasa pasyanti yam yogana Yogis, real yogis, see the form of Vishnu within the heart by meditation. The devotees, however, meet the Supreme Person face to face, just as we meet face to face and speak face to face. The Supreme Personality of Godhead orders, Supply me this, and the devotee directly serves the Lord by supplying what he wants. 
Thus there are different realizations of the absolute truth. And although he is equal to everyone, it is up to us to understand him according to our advancement. Therefore Kunti says, Samam Charantam Sarvatra. In distributing your mercy, you are equal to everyone. The word Charantam means moving. The Lord moves everywhere, within and without, and we simply have to make our vision clear so that we may see Him. By devotional service, we can purify our senses so that we may perceive the presence of God. Those who are less intelligent simply try to find God within, but those who are advanced in intelligence can see the Lord both within and without. The yogic system of meditation is actually meant for those who are less intelligent. One who practices meditation in yoga must control the senses, yoga indriya samyama. Our senses are very restless, and by practicing the different asanas or sitting postures, one must control the mind and senses so that one can concentrate upon the form of Vishnu within the heart. This is the yoga system recommended for those who are too much absorbed in the bodily concept of life. However, because bhaktas, devotees, are more advanced, they do not need to undergo a separate process to control their senses. Rather, by engaging in devotional service, they are already controlling their senses. For example, if one is engaged in worshipping the deity, cleansing the temple, decorating the deity, cooking for the deity, and so on, one's senses are already engaged in the service of the Absolute Truth, so where is the chance of their being diverted? Rishikena Rishikesha Sevanam Bhaktir Uchite Bhakti, devotional service, simply means engaging our senses, Rishika, in the service of the master of the senses, Rishikesha. Now our senses are engaged in sense gratification. I am thinking that because I am this body, I must satisfy my senses. In fact, however, this is a contaminated stage of life. When one comes to the understanding that he is not this body, but a spiritual soul, part and parcel of God, he knows that his spiritual senses should be engaged in the service of the Supreme Spiritual Being. Thus one attains liberation, mukti. One attains liberation when one gives up the false idea that the body is the self, and when one resumes his actual position of service to the Lord. Muktir hitvanyata rupam svarupena vyavastiti from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 2nd Canto, 10th Chapter, 6th Text. When we are conditioned, we give up our original constitutional position, which is described by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as being that of eternal service to Krishna. Jivera Svarupahaya, Krishnera Nityadas. But as soon as we employ ourselves in the service of the Lord, we are liberated immediately. There is no need to pass through some preliminary process. This very act of engaging one's senses in the service of the Lord is evidence that one is liberated. This liberation is open for everyone. Samam Charantam. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna does not say to Arjuna, only you may come to me and become liberated. No, the Lord is available for everyone. When he says, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mame Kam Sharanam Vraja, give up all other duties and surrender unto me, he is speaking not only to Arjun, but to everyone. Arjun was the original target, but in fact Bhagavad Gita was spoken for everyone, for all human beings, and therefore one must take advantage of it.
Krishna's impartiality is compared to that of the sun. The sun does not consider, here is a poor man, here is a low-class man, here is a hog, I shall not distribute my sunshine to them. No, the sun is equal toward all, and one simply has to take advantage of it. The sunshine is available, but if we close our doors and want to keep ourselves in darkness, that is our decision. Similarly, Krishna is everywhere, Krishna is for everyone, and Krishna is ready to accept us as soon as we surrender. Samam Charantam. There is no restriction. People may make a distinction between lower class and higher class, but Krishna says, Mam hi parta vyapashritya ye pi su papa yoneya from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 32, which means, quote, even though one may supposedly be of a lower class, that doesn't matter. If he surrenders to me, he is also eligible to come back home, back to Godhead, unquote. That same Krishna is described by Kunti Devi as eternal time. Everything takes place within time, but our time calculations of past, present, and future are relative. A small insect's measurement of past, present, and future is different from our past, present, and future. And similarly, the past, present, and future of Brahma, the chief creative living being within this universe, are different from ours. But Krishna has no past, present, or future. Therefore, he is eternal. We have a past, present, and future because we change from one body to another. The body we have now is dated. At a certain date, I was born of my father and mother and now this body will stay for some time. It will grow. It will produce some byproducts. Then it will become old and dwindle and then vanish. And then I shall have to accept another body. When the past, present, and future of my present body are finished, I shall accept another body. And again my past, present, and future will begin. But Krishna has no past, present or future, because he does not change his body. That is the difference between ourselves and Krishna. The eternal position of Krishna is revealed in Bhagavad Gita. There Krishna said to Arjuna, in the past, millions of years ago, I spoke this philosophy of Bhagavad Gita to the sun god. Arjuna appeared not to believe this. Of course, Arjuna knew everything, but for our education he said to Krishna, Krishna, we are contemporaries, and since we were born at practically the same time, how can I believe that you spoke this philosophy so long ago to the sun god? Then Krishna replied, my dear Arjun, you were also present then, but you have forgotten, whereas I have not. That is the difference. Past, present, and future pertain to persons who forget. But for one who does not forget, who lives eternally, there is no past, present, or future. Kunti therefore addresses Krishna as eternal. Manye tvam kalam and because he is eternal, he is the full controller, Ishanam. By Krishna's extraordinary behavior, Kunti could understand that Krishna is eternal and that Krishna is the supreme controller. He has no beginning and no end, Anadi Nidhanam, and therefore he is Vibhu, the supreme, the greatest. We are Anu, the smallest, and Krishna is Vibhu, the greatest. We are part and parcel of Krishna, and therefore Krishna is both the smallest and the greatest, whereas we are only the smallest. Vibhu, the greatest, must be all-inclusive. If one has a large bag, one can hold many things, whereas, whereas in a small bag one cannot. 
Because Krishna is Vibhu, the greatest, he includes everything, even past, present and future time. And he is all-pervading, present everywhere. Without Krishna, matter cannot develop. Atheistic scientists say that life comes from matter, but that is nonsense. Matter is one energy of Krishna, and spirit is another. The spirit is superior energy, and matter is inferior energy. The matter develops when the superior energy is present. For example, two or three hundred years ago, the land of America was not developed. But because some superior living entities from Europe came here, America is now very much developed. Therefore, the cause of development is the superior energy. In Africa, Australia, and many other places, there is still vacant land that is undeveloped. Why is it undeveloped? Because the superior energy of advanced living entities has not touched it. As soon as the superior energy touches it, the same land will develop so many factories, houses, cities, roads, cars, and so on. The point of this example is that matter cannot develop by itself. That is not possible. Superior energy must touch it, and then it will be active. To give another example, a machine is matter. It is inferior energy, and therefore unless an operator comes to touch the machine, it will not act. One may have a very costly car, but unless a driver comes, in millions of years it will never go anywhere. Thus it is common sense to understand that matter cannot work independently. It cannot work unless the superior energy, the living entity, touches it. So how can we conclude that life develops from matter? Rascal scientists may say this, but they do not have sufficient knowledge. All the universes have developed because of Krishna's presence, as mentioned in the Brahma Samhita. Adantara sta paramanu chayantara stam. The scientists are now studying atoms, and they are finding that electrons, protons, and other particles act in so many ways. Why are these particles active? Because Krishna is present there. This is real scientific understanding. One should scientifically understand Krishna. Krishna has no past, present, and future. He is eternal time, with no beginning and no end, and He is equal to everyone. We simply have to prepare ourselves to see Krishna and understand Krishna. That is the purpose of Krishna consciousness.